Only four of the 700 children that have come through the school return to the criminal justice system. Sometimes you just need somebody to listen. Not necessarily comment or even have a solution, but just listen. Today, three marble eggs lay in the glass trophy case, a reminder of lessons learned. You can just help one at a time. That's just my dog. One at a time. And we're all my child. It all began with a boy who loved to read and had a dream. I had this wonderful, wonderful imagination. I thought one day I would walk. And in his own special way, Judge Jimmy Edwards has already been there and bad. What happened to everything? I really want to get the innovative concept. They become successful in this. What happens to them to turn their behaviors around? They find hope. They find the determination to turn that hope into action and start working toward a better life for themselves. They like better than the one they were born into. It all begins with hope and determination. And now it ends with hope and determination. This is universal. In every nation on earth, every city, every suburb, every ghetto, people strive for a better life for themselves and for the next generation. It's what all of us want. We were filled with dreams, and America is a place where dreams come true. If you can dream it, you can achieve it in this great country of ours. I believe that everyone is entitled freedom and equality, and to pursue their dreams of a better life. Good afternoon. I want to compliment Missouri State Southern State University, its faculty, its staff, for their leadership and commitment to equal education for all. I want to also thank Stephanie Hopkins, who's done a tremendous job of getting me here firstly, and secondly, getting all of you here. Thank you so very much, Stephanie. I also want to thank the Teaching and Learning Committee for its commitment to make a measurable difference in the lives of children, irrespective of who they are and what they are. More importantly, I want to thank all of you for being here this afternoon. I know that it's Friday. I know that it's cold. <laughs> I appreciate so very much you being here. As you know, I come from the opposite side of the state, the city of St. Louis. It's a long ride on Interstate 44 to connect our two cities. St. Louis has always been associated with Eastern connections, while Joplin is far more Western in heritage and in character. If you knew nothing at all about St. Louis region before last summer, you know now that we're going through a tough introspection about racial and class disparity in our community, sparked by the police shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri last August and still rever reverberating very loudly to this day. It is bound to shape St. Louis positively or negatively for many, many years to come. To the extent that you've been aware of these developments, I wouldn't be surprised if you perhaps subconsciously have seen them through the eyes or lenses of over there. I don't blame you. That's natural. We all tend to do that. How often do we see coverage of sensational crime, for example, and the people in that town or in that neighborhood or on that block say, it's such a shock. I never thought something like that could happen here. So for the past few months, people across our country, even people across the world, have been telling themselves, wow, St. Louis is really going through some trouble over race and class issues. Or oh, man, they've got a problem over there. 
I'm not trying to diminish our responsibility in St. Louis to address the unique and historic and demographic factors that led up to this. That's on us, and we accept it. But I want to suggest that St. Louis is anything but unique in manifesting something that negatively impacts every city, every state, every nation, every culture, and that is something that we call implicit bias. It's here in Joplin, it's here on campus, it's here in this room right now. It will probably always exist at some level in our individual and collective consciousness, but we definitely have the ability to control the extent to which it results in injustice, in falling short of our potential as a college, as a town, as a state, as a country, as a people. The first step, though, is to recognize that implicit bias is not a problem over there. It's global, and it requires global attention. But it has to start with you and me right here, right now. It's a developmental process that leaves most with subconscious negative attitudes about people or groups of people based only on their differences from us. Race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation. Typically, we develop these attitudes about people who are not members of our own group, but implicit bias can also be directed at people who look and think like we do. Many researchers believe that implicit bias begins at a very, very young age and is fueled by symbolic attitudes that we develop over the course of our lives. Most people are unaware of their own implicit bias. It resides in our subconscious or our unconscious mind, the part of the brain normally beyond our direct control. Many studies show that our unconscious attitudes are less egalitarian than we explicitly think or say. But the less we talk about and confront it, the more our unconscious mind reinforces implicit bias. What can we do about it, starting on this campus? The many educators in this room know that teaching is changing toward more transformational, collaborative learning from transactional reward and punishment. Our training in diversity has been largely transactional. We need to start talking about implicit bias in more transformative ways. We can set up intentional communities, such as trust circles and partner networks, to connect with people from racial, ethnic, and orientation groups that are different from our own. We can expose disparities in critical opportunity domains, including in education, but also lift up examples of people who have overcome barriers to opportunity. To do this, you need only thoroughly learn this campus. Then monitor, measure, and market programs for diversity leadership and the eradication of bias. It's important to, select, to celebrate and to merchandise your success. You must train and retrain multiple audiences, including teachers, employers, judges, politicians, and high school students about the causes and consequences of implicit bias. Some of us may think we're well versed because we went through a diversity training program years ago. But it's essential to continually update and modernize <coughs> the approach. Beyond this awareness training, you must take the next step and educate yourselves, students and faculty, to become agents of change, to improve opportunity for all people in this community. We must continually evaluate our communications more critically for evidence of racial and ethnic bias. We must make this broad-based effort sustainable and self-perpetuating. It's not a one and done effort, but a lifelong global challenge to diminish and finally eradicate implicit bias in future generations. And most 
importantly. We must carefully, critically, and honestly examine our own personal attitudes for evidence of implicit bias. Let me tell you a little bit about how I became aware of the impact of implicit bias in one very crucial area of our educational system. In my 23 years as a circuit judge in the city of St. Louis, I have come to understand that there is nothing like the power of education to lift people out of their circumstances and to change their lives. In my mind, education is the key to success. It is the key to so many of life's rewards. Certainly, it is the key to a stable paycheck. We all want that. But with education comes the ability to open doors and to explore opportunities today that were not available to us yesterday. Education is the difference between a job and a career. Doing what you have to do to pay the bills and doing what you love to do. What inspires you to get up each morning and look forward to starting your day. In my experience as a judge, I can tell you that you don't see too many people in those orange jail jumpsuits with college degrees standing before judges. Most important, with education comes the ability to dream and to have hope. However, as the city juvenile court judge from 2007 through 2012, I saw too many children who had no hope, who had no dreams. The opportunity to rise above their circumstances through education had been denied them. Instead, they were caught in a cycle that we have come to call the school to prison pipeline. It is here, I believe, that we see the most insidious Im impact of implicit bias, when it has metastasized from the unconscious attitudes of others to how we see ourselves. Too many African American children cut off from school are also cut off from hope, skills, a place in the social structure. They have become outcasts. You may remember the emergence of zero tolerance in the 1990s as a response to the perceived epidemic of drug, alcohol, and violent behaviors in public schools. As it turned out, zero tolerance made zero sense. But schools continue to cling to it. Research showed that zero tolerance policies could actually increase bad behavior without creating safer more effective schools. Worse, studies found that implicit bias in implementing zero tolerance led to the higher rates of detention, suspension, or expulsion among minority students compared to their white counterparts for the exact same infraction. <laughs> minority children also were over-referred for special education related to behavioral problems, creating a disproportionate two-track system for students of color, the disciplinary track and the special education track. Researchers found that implicit bias was at work in each of the decision points that led to this two-track system. It demonstrated that instead of relying on explicit criteria, teachers and administrators based their recommendations for disciplinary track or special ed track on loose subjective criteria that left wide openings for implicit racial bias to enter in. At the same time, minority children are underrepresented in advanced placement and college prep courses. And many schools attended primarily by minority students do not even offer these classes, which are prime factor colleges and universities consider in admissions decisions. Here's an example of how implicit bias plays out. In a study, researchers ask teachers to grade essentially identical papers from a test class. At the top of each paper was the name of the supposed student author. Some names were designed to sound black, and some 
to sound white. Lakeisha Washington and Susan Smith, for example. <laughs> By a significant margin, the teacher scored papers lower when the student name sounded black. These teachers would probably tell you that they harbor no racial discrimination, and they mean it. What's happening here is that unconscious, implicit bias lowers their expectations for students of color and stimulates subtle differences in the way they behave toward these students. Less praise and recognition and more discipline, for example. By the time some of these children reach middle school, school has become less a place of education than frustration. When they act out on this frustration, their education is often abruptly curtailed through suspension and or expulsions. To top it off, most of these children come from generational poverty. Poor families must focus their attention on solving immediate concrete problems. Families in generational poverty don't have dreams. Reacting to and solving concrete problems is a skill, but it's far different from practicing to make good choices learning to be accountable for those choices and developing the power to build a better future. Children in generational poverty grow up not knowing how to dream without the hope that good choices today can lead to a brighter future. Without school, they're increasingly exposed to negative influences. They wind up in the juvenile court. They have entered the pipeline to prison. Unexpectedly, on Monday of this week, a national study was released by the Center of Civil Rights Remedies at UCLA, which reported that the state of Missouri elementary schools have the highest suspension and expulsion rates for black children in any state in America. What a shame. It is important. It is very, very important that all of us look for ways to interrupt and reverse this pipeline in our beloved state. In 2009, I was getting tired of seeing children come through my courtroom only to return to an environment fraught with the same old problems. I knew I could lock them up. I could send them to jail. I could force them into community service. But what good would any of that do when inevitably they would be returning back to the same bad influences that got them in trouble in the first place. So in August 2009, with the help of some remarkably caring and committed partners, in the city of St. Louis, I started a school. Not just any school, but a special kind of school aimed at tackling some of their persistent and stubborn problems. We call it the Innovative Concept Academy. You know I can go all day about what we do there. But the main thing we try to do is to give these children hope. I know that effective schools keep children in school and have a high amount of supervision and instruction time. So in and out, we had a hunch, a gut feeling, that we could produce change within each of our children to rewire their brains, so to speak. The old educational model, though, was based on the idea that children's brains stayed the same. And you had to work within those same limits. This is true if, of course, circumstances around that child remain the same. The good news is that brains can and do change every day. Our brains are built for change. In fact, the worse off the student, the greater the capacity for change. It's easier to raise an IQ from 80 to 100 than from 100 to 120. To change the brain, you just have to change the circumstances. That's what we set out to do. The most important, changing child circumstances require an adult, any adult. Any adult who cares. There are plenty of adults who are substituting for parents. Maybe it's you, maybe it's the teacher 
a basketball coach, a social worker, or even a volunteer. What children really need in life is an adult who is making sure that they don't have too much idle time and are not making wrong choices. My children at Innovative Concept Academy want to learn. And we have the appropriate expectations for them to learn. One of those expectations is the school uniform. Believe it or not, they like the uniform. They especially like the top. You see, they tell me that the top makes them feel smart. The teachers respect and listen to me when I have on my top, they tell me. The tie symbolizes hope. When we visualize success, we try harder and we explore more options. We work with the task, not against it. Focusing on results, not excuses. Our staff works to foster a growth mindset in our students. We remind them of the value of effort, not talent. We may tell them, for example, you worked really hard on that. That kind of effort will pay off. Winners are those who work the hardest. We model and teach that the process of learning is a joy in itself. We strengthen the value of learning from mistakes. We try to avoid labeling our children as smart or gifted. Instead, we reinforce their effort their approach, and their accepting challenge. We talk about when you graduate rather than if you graduate. That's because our task is in two steps. First, we have to instill hope, a realistic vision for an improved future. Then, we have to instill belief that the student has the capacity to get there. We are making great progress. However, I don't want to leave you with the impression that implicit bias afflicts only the poor, the most at risk, the most vulnerable. It is present in inner city public schools, but also present at our great universities. It holds us back at the top of corporations and in the halls of government. In big cities, mid-sized communities, and rural villages, from Joplin to St. Louis and all around the world. The lessons we learn here at Missouri Southern State University can apply equally well to Innovative Concept Academy and vice versa. But they must not stop there. Overcoming our implicit bias is a global challenge and requires a global response. That's why the leadership training and education we develop in our classrooms and on our campuses today are crucial to the worldwide effort. It need not be daunting. I think of the internet and how it's now possible for one person with a few keystrokes to literally reach around the world in a moment. Each of us can be that person. Starting by examining our own personal biases, then starting conversations that eventually change the world. I want to share a very inspiring story of activism to you involving our chess program. <laughs> chess is a cerebral game. It's the type of game that requires you to, to think. You can't be too impulsive. You have to be deliberative. As you saw on the screen, it is just like life. If you make a bad move, in a chess game, you lose your coin. On the streets, if you move too quickly, make the wrong move, you can move your, you can lose your life. Think before you act, and try to plan your life two or three steps ahead, not just one. Or lessons my children learn from the game of chess. I took nine of my students to participate in the Scholastic Chess Tournament at a very wealthy school in the suburbs of St. Louis. When I take my children to tournaments, we ride in juvenile court vans with police officers as our escorts. And the words juvenile court clearly visible on the side of the vans. There is no denying where we're coming from. 
And when we pulled up to this very nice suburban school in St. Louis County and got off the van, more than 800 eyes were staring at us. It's safe to say we were a bit of a surprise that day. I suspect that they stared and I told my children they can't believe we weren't ties <laughs> to a chess tournament. But the story here belongs to Amy. Amy was a very affable, blind, and blue-eyed 11-year-old competitor who approached one of my children, Andre, who had checked after he checked in, and she, she told Andre that they would be playing against each other in the first round. You see, Andre was 18 years old, and he had gold teeth from cheek to cheek. He had long, dreadlock hair. Well, that's not relevant. I just said that because I have no hair. <laughs> but Andre could not believe that he would be playing against a little girl. But this little girl was bold. She was one of Missouri's youngest state chess champions. She said to Andre, I want you to know that I have never lost a chess game to a grown-up. And then she said, ever. <laughs> she immediately took Andre's hand and she skipped him away, right away to the chess table. I could not believe that he followed her. <laughs> ten minutes later, Andre was back. For those of you that play chess, you know ten minutes is, is awfully fast to be returning back. But Andre was back. He had the biggest smile on his face. And before the other kids could ask him, he said, yes, she kicked my ass. <laughs> but she said that I was the best adult that she had ever played, ever. An hour later, and he saw Andre seated alone, and she asked him how he was doing, and he told her not so well. He told her that he had lost all three chess games that he had played. Immediately, Amy sat down, and she started to tutor Andre on how to win a chess game. You see, children are pure, and they are innocent. For them, compassion and tolerance are not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. Whatever they pick up, good or bad, they tend to share with each other. Andre won his final game. On that day, this was the most significant thing to happen in our lives. An 11-year-old girl taught my 18-year-old young man how to lose and how to win in the course of one afternoon. There is good in everyone. And if not for Andy's help on that day, Andre could not have succeeded. Why is this important? Andy did not judge Andre's exterior. It mattered not to her that he was black, perhaps gay, or even a male. You see, she looked him in his eye. The eyes are the doorways to the heart. That's where love resides, irrespective of one's exterior, irrespective of one's race, sexual orientation, gender, Country of origin, implicit bias, and apathy are the enemy of good people. What will you do to get out of that darkness? You see, when we choose to be indifferent, to look the other way, play ostrich, or voice a discordant viewpoint, and accept institutional, structural, and individual bias, we become part of the problem. And when students witness disparate treatment, <clears throat> mean spiritness, or a quiet mind that no one is addressing, they in turn grow apathetic toward each <laughs> other and the people they count on to teach and to protect them. And if they are not protected, they give up. 
and they fail. The responsibility that each of us in this room has for opening our eyes to the problem facing our community and for committing ourselves to be a part of a solution on the critical issue of inclusion goes without saying. I will close by returning where I started. I want to tell you that as I stand before you today, I am truly excited, hopeful, and gratified by the peaceful protest I have witnessed over the last few months. We have seen the birth of a new youth movement that has spread rapidly across our country and even internationally that grows every day, that is bringing forth young, inspired, and marvelously effective leadership. Don't get me wrong, to be sure. This movement includes all ages, as well as diverse races, gender, sexual orientation, religions, and even political persuasions. But as with the civil rights and anti-war movements of the 1960s, it's predominantly led by the young. It is driven by a very basic but still dynamic and revolutionary concept, one written in our very own Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. That is, that all lives matter. Yes, this movement is shouting that basic founding principle in the halls of power, the centers of commerce, the enclaves of the rich, and yes, and most importantly, on our college campuses. Our children, yes, our children, are calling out and directing our attention to the more subtle, insidious undercurrent of race and class division that we have allowed to creep back into America's culture. And they're telling us we're past all of that and we're not going back. Our children are crying out to us from rural to urban areas across the land saying, Every life matters. They are shaking us up to recognize that the struggle of each underprivileged individual is our own struggle. We can't pursue a separate agenda from those who face discrimination because of their physical abilities, gender, religion, country of origin, age, or sexual orientation. Look. Just look. Look at the multicolored faces of those you see in the streets today. And you see that indeed, we are all in this together. And I'm very impressed with what I see in this movement. I see medical students walking out of hospitals and staging dying in the street, then returning to save lives. I see people protesting by evening, then returning to write articles for the New York Times. Indeed, I see all of you. This is a strong and real movement and is not going away. At the same time, we need to remember that a youth movement is sometimes innocent, sometimes naive, sometimes even thrash. The young, particularly in the age of instant communication, can be too quick to follow false prophets, to believe malicious rumors, to succumb to vile incitements. We have to counsel careful evaluation, patience, and focus, keeping eyes on the prize. We must not just turn activism over to the children and get out of the way. To go along with this youth movement, we need an adult movement. We need to make sure that others are not teaching our children the ways of hate. We need to be careful what we say and how we act in our homes when the public is not looking. Because if our children hear us venting about race and gender and sexual orientation at our worst in the privacy of our homes, they will not accept our wiser counsel publicly in our better public moments. We must model positivism and not cynicism. I am indeed convinced that the arc of the moral universe is long. And like Dr. King said, 
I believe, it bends toward justice. From the tragedy of Ferguson comes great opportunity. We must seize the energy and the purpose of this movement and channel it right here in Joplin, as it should be all over our world. Indeed, ladies and gentlemen, it has been my pleasure to give you my brief formal remarks. At this time, I would invite any questions that you have of me with respect to the innovative concept of academy or implicit bias. Thank you very much for listening. Now you put a label on his head. You've labeled that 
child. This is all about expectations. If you tell me every day I'm a gang member, I'll become a gang member in my mind. If you tell me I'm stupid every day, I think I'm stupid. We can do a better job. We have an obligation to give to do a better job. Students, are you listening to me? <laughs> this is going to be your responsibility. You're going to have to address this problem. Question? Yes? Yeah, how's your uh, school funded? And secondly, do you think that your college or other cities kind of play uh, bonds and programs on here? And I'll answer the last question first. Whether other states are interested in replicating. I uh, received the Rich Post Award, which is the nation's highest judicial award in our country. And uh, I was nominated and received the award by Chief Justice John Roberts of the U.S. Supreme Court. So I was there with 250 of my closest friends. We were the, the chief judges from all over the country. And so he puts his arms around me and he said, you know what? What Judge Edwards is doing makes good sense to me, and I and I support it. I didn't quite know how I was going to deal with Chief Justice Roberts. I had never met Chief Justice Roberts, but I was excited after I got there because he was affable and he was very, very decent. But I was there about a month after he had struck down Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, so I didn't know how I was going to handle that. But, but, but he was decent. And once he said that, judges from all over the country started to call me for replication purposes. So the answer to your question, yes, is being replicated. We're being funded because I have this wonderful partnership, a terrific partnership with the St. Louis Public School. And it made sense for them because I was taking all their bad kids. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking all your bad kids, so it makes sense. You know, your teacher don't have to deal with them. Your principal don't have to deal with them. Give them to Jeff. Yeah. All right, so I said, fine, I'll take them. But you have to provide me with the building, the teachers, the principal, the buses, you have to provide me with the cafeteria, and you have to make sure that the utilities and the buildings are great. Then I had this wonderful, wonderful person who's the chief executive of our Merge Goodwill. See, not for profit means not for profit. You have to give your money away. You, you can't make a profit. So I say, you are not for profit. You have $13 million. Why don't you Give some of it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and to my amazement, it happened. Let me tell you guys a secret. This judge thing works. <laughs> <laughs> this, this judge thing works. I mean, when I, when I call somebody, they call me back. And they show up. And so, to my amazement, all of this stuff started to happen. And then I needed to figure out how we're going to do it. So, uh, Merge Goodwill, you guys have a Goodwill here. Merge Goodwill is my partner, a terrific partner. <coughs> and it has probably given me over a million dollars. And so we have the public school. And then we have the court system. So I moved four employees from the court system in the school. We're managing all of that behavior in the school. Then Merge Goodwill put employees in the school. The public school has employees in the school. But, you know, that's, that's wonderful. But let me tell you, who really makes a difference in my school are the volunteers. And the ones that come to mind, I call them the group of eight. The group of eight, they're the toughest, the smartest, and the most caring of all. I have eight nuns <laughs> at my school. And we're celebrating one of them's birthday next week. She'll be 83 years old. Been with me for six years, never missed a day, rain, sleet, or snow. And when they come in the building, the demeanor of the building changes. It gets bad. You know when the nuns are there. <laughs> All the swearing stops. <laughs> kids go to class. The nuns are there. The nuns are there. And they love these kids and they embrace these kids. And so these nuns are all white, right? So when they come in, they're hugging our kids. Our kids are hugging them. And, and every day, we're teaching our children to be respectful, understand diversity, and appreciate the generosity of others. Everything that I had, somebody gave it to me. And I appreciate that. And that's the reason I try to give it back to them. So 
But I need to teach them that they need to understand the generosity of others, whether it's their time, whether it's the food that they share with them, or whether they tell them that they can be good children. We have to teach the thoughts. Thank you. I'm grateful. I appreciate it. If we teach that, I know to teach that. So we're teaching all of those types of things. And it's imperative that we do so. St. Louis is the most dangerous place in America. I can't say that. I think that the information that we receive about St. Louis is too often framed in the negative. It never highlights their successes. It only emphasizes their failures. And I can tell you that, that, that with respect to St. Louis, how we define St. Louis in our state, the sky is not falling. The sky is not falling with our children. And none of you should leave here thinking that the sky is falling. Our kids are doing okay. We get these sensational types of things, and of course, we, we just, these things explode. But I'm, I'm not prepared to tell you that St. Louis is the most dangerous place in this country. Because we do all of these mathematical types of things based upon 100,000 this and 100,000 and that. But I can tell you that in the city of St. Louis, there were 5,000 uh, uh, car campers and car thefts and plotting, and juveniles were accused of 300 of them last year. We had a sensational murder involving three juveniles a couple months ago involving a Bosnian immigrant and a hand. But prior to that, we had not had a murder in the city of St. Louis involving a juvenile probably in eight years. And so, uh, our kids are doing okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. 